Yeah, buddy. Ooh. Yeah, buddy. Ooh. We're gonna get that. Oh, I'm getting this tree. Yeah. I'm getting this tree. Oh, yeah. oh these rocks. Oh, they don't stand a chance. Oh, oh wait. Hold on, man. You got knowledge stone. Greetings, fellow interloper. My name is Taylor, and I play No Man's Sky. In doing videos on the past couple expeditions, it's become pretty clear that not only is the game bringing people back from a rather disappointing start five years ago, but it definitely seems to be getting a fresh look from many newer players as well. And I've gotten a lot of questions in my comment section on my videos about things in the game that I've, quite honestly, have taken for granted. Because of this, I sat down and compiled a list of what I would consider the 10 most confusing things for a player who's new to the No Man's Sky universe. So if you're a newer player, odds are you'll probably learn a bunch from this video. And if you're a pro traveler who knows this game inside and out, well, I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are on what I left off the list and what could be useful to the newer player. Who knows, your name and suggestion could be featured on future videos. Let's face it, this list could be 50 most confusing things, so yeah, needless to say, it was a challenge to pare this down to only 10. Hence, the volume one. But I will say that my number one is what I'm most proud of because that one has haunted me for the longest time, so I hope you find value in it. All right, let's dive in. Starting our list off at number 10 is understanding how big this universe is, how it's organized, and most importantly, how to get from one galaxy to another. The No Man's Sky universe is made up of 256 various galaxies, starting with, of course, everyone's favorite Greek mathematician, Euclid. Each galaxy falls into four different types. Which type it is determines the odds of finding certain biomes. The four types are normal, empty, Hello? lush. Oh, I think I can raise a family here. Ow! You're gonna die, plant. And harsh. My horns are frozen. Whoa, shit. Don't worry, every galaxy is still made up of all biomes, but depending on its type, that determines the likelihood of coming across that type of biome. So, for instance, if you're after a paradise planet, your search will be a lot easier if you're in a lush galaxy. To get from one galaxy to another, you could go super simple and just hitch a ride with a fellow traveler you happen to meet on the anomaly. For this, your multiplayer would need to be turned on in your settings. Or you could do it the old-fashioned way and travel to the center of the galaxy where you'll then be presented a choice to go forth into the next galaxy. The order of galaxies is set, and only when you reach 256 will you then travel back to Euclid. Another tidbit about galaxies is that their types are known and predictable. If we took a look at the first 10 galaxies, you'll see that they're made up of a mix of all four types, with normal being the dominant galaxy type. In total, there are 179 normal galaxies, 26 harsh, 26 empty, and 25 lush. For more information on these specifics, our friends at the No Man's Sky Wiki has an outstanding galaxy breakdown to take a look at. A link to this is in the description. All right, coming in at number nine is understanding the difference between crafting and refining. Crafting is done in menu with items you have on you, like making a hermetic seal out of condensed carbon, or mining dihydrogen, and then converting it to dihydrogen jelly. In order to craft an item, you must first have its blueprint. When you go into your craft menu, you can see all your available blueprints. If they're darkened, you own it, but you don't have all the necessary components to make it. In many cases, you'll need to refine items in order to use them in crafting. As is the case with sulfurine, for instance. Now, you could find sulfurine and mine it directly, or you could take nitrogen and throw it in the refiner to get sulfurine at a ratio of 3 to 1, meaning you'll need 3 nitrogen to get back 1 sulfurine. This is just one example out of literally hundreds of possibilities when it comes to refining. As a side note, a nice resource I like using is the Recipes NMS app. It's well organized and clean interface make it super easy to look up certain recipes and craftable items. 
as well as food recipes too if you're so inclined. And no, I have no affiliation with this app, I just like the design and layout. Number 8 is the difference between a save beacon and a save point. Both will produce a save which can be loaded at any point by going into your menu and selecting manual save. Where they differ is their ability to show up on your map. So if you want to mark a specific spot on a planet to come back to, then you'll want to drop a save beacon. You can even make it a certain color to help you remember what it was you were marking. We'll make it red just for fun, and you'll see that it's easy to spot either when you're on the planet far away or in space. The other save that's in your menu is your auto save. This happens whenever you exit your ship and you get that message, you know, that pops up telling you a restore point has been saved. Number seven is interacting with the trade terminal and knowing the difference between trade goods and functional goods. For a while, I never quite understood what those first few goods were and what purpose they served. They have a distinctive light gray background, so I knew they were something different. Quite simply, you can purchase them in one system and resell in another system for profit. You obviously need to be in the right system to get the most bang for your buck. If you're interested in learning more about trading, I go over this in greater detail in my Galaxy Map Mastery video. Number 6. Where to get salvaged data in order to unlock blueprints at the construction terminal on the Anomaly, as well as where you find salvage frigate modules to unlock blueprints to upgrade your freighter. This one took me some time when I first started out. Fortunately, salvage data is plentiful on most planets. All you need to do is use your analysis visor to find buried technology modules, and then use your terrain manipulator to unearth them. How many you get is random, but you can get two, three, or sometimes even four at a time, which really adds up. And if you've unlocked all there is to unlock, well, there's still an easy way to make a buck by selling each one for 52 grand each. Salvage frigate modules are a whole other thing. Those can be obtained from visiting fleets that spawn once you enter a system. You'll need to put on your pirate hat for this one. Since snagging these is not exactly legal, it will cost you a loss in standing with the system's dominant race once you fire upon a ship and collect their goods. Fortunately, this damaged relationship is easily repaired by offering relics to that race when you see them at trading posts or at space stations. Vikings love effigies, Corvax love casings, and Gax love relics. All of which can be easily purchased off an NPC pilot at a trading post or occasionally at galactic trade terminals. Number five is when you need to build an Exocraft Geo Bay versus being able to just call it in like you've seen me do in many videos. This does throw a lot of people, and admittingly it was confusing to me when I first started. The simple answer is having an orbital Exocraft materializer installed on your freighter. This allows you to summon your Exocraft without actually building a Geo Bay. The one thing that would prevent you from doing so is if your freighter is not in the same system. So if you're looking for your Exocraft, all you need to do is summon your freighter, and then you can summon your Exocraft. Now this isn't to be confused with the Exocraft summoning station, which really only works if your Exocraft is on the same planet as you. Honestly though, you're better off just grinding out a few more salvage data so you can unlock the OEM. So if you don't happen to have this on your freighter yet, I highly suggest doing so. Once you have it installed, building Geo Bays will be a thing of the past, unless you like them as a base aesthetic. Number five. When you're first starting out, you're never quite sure how mods work and how many you can actually install unless you play around, which admittingly is where the fun is. Once you've spent a few nanites and accumulated some mods for your equipment, you've probably found that installing any more than three of a purchased mod will overload your system and render every one of those useless. But the nice thing is you can have three in your main inventory, as well as three in your technology tab. And keep in mind, these are in addition to the mods that are purchased inside the anomaly. Not only that, but how you arrange your mods affects your total numbers. So make sure to arrange them in a manner where all of your purchased mods are touching, and whatever system you're upgrading, say your hyperdrive for instance, it's in contact with one of those mods. Just by moving things around, you can see fluctuations in hyperdrive distance here. 
Any mod that gives you a proximity bonus, you'll notice a colored outline around them once they're grouped together. Alright, on to number four. The first time I saw that I needed a walker brain or quad servos, I, of course, I had zero clue what they were talking about. Even once I discovered what they were, I had no idea how to harvest them. So when you're first starting out, I can understand the confusion when you're shooting a walker only to see them taking no damage whatsoever. Well, fortunately for me, my aim was terrible, and I accidentally hit its leg and noticed that the armor was taking damage. So the rest, as they say, is history. Along those same lines, getting a quad servo was also a mystery, but that riddle was quickly solved the first time I managed to destroy my first quad. This was before they got a buff and were protected by sentinels. Now I just move in a circle and take down all the sentinels first before I battle Sparky. Number three is knowing what the difference between portals and teleporters and the process of getting all the glyphs. Teleporters are a great way to take you to previously visited space stations or any of your bases. The great part is it doesn't matter which galaxy the base is in. Portals, on the other hand, only work within the galaxy they're in and require 12 symbols or glyphs to send you on your way. Every planet has an address and can easily be found once you enter camera mode. If you're worried about getting all the symbols, well, just complete the storyline and you'll eventually get all 16 with very minimal effort. You can also chat with travelers in the space station to get them as well. For all of those details, as well as learning about monoliths, check out my full tutorial on portals here. Coming in at number two is how to add frigates to your fleet and how much you should spend on them. Running expeditions is some of the easiest passive income there is, and it's also a lot of fun. As I look back, the process to add them is super simple. It's having the money early on to afford them that can be the challenging part, but that I'll save for another video. After you've gotten your free freighter, you can then add to your fleet. To add, all you need to do is wait around for other fleets to spawn in, and you can see these green markers pop up on your compass. To buy one, just fly up close and you'll get a message from the frigate with an option to add them to your fleet. This leads me to which class you should buy. Conventional wisdom says the higher the better, right? As you send out your frigates, they will actually upgrade in class as you give them more and more experience. So the bottom line is, if money is tight, just buy a C-class with enough experience, they will eventually become an S-class. Well, most of the time. Now, one of the things to look for on frigates is how many expeditions they've already run. Anything after 55 is where you'll stop getting experience. So... The takeaway is you want a frigate that's a C-class with a small amount of expeditions under their belt. If they're C-class and they have a higher amount of expeditions, then you have a shorter window to rank them up. So number one is still probably something I should have known more about sooner, but that's the mysterious function of planetary archives or colossal archives. There's one particular area of the archive that has tripped me up for a while, and that's these artifact exchange vaults. Every time I have some ancient bones or other relics, now you would think they'd be acceptable, but it never allows me to exchange them. Well, after a lot of testing, the solution was fairly simple, even though I never took the time to understand why some were accepted and some were not. While finding and unearthing ancient bones feels like they're all fossil samples, they actually aren't labeled as such. Here, you can see that these are labeled as excavated bones. In other words, they don't have the word sample in them. To get samples, you need to find ancient ruins. The traditional method is to use alien cartographic data maps from the space station cartographer. This will lead you to an ancient plaque, which then directs you to an ancient ruin, if you decide to seek out knowledge from the past. So as a side note, if you select the first option, you've basically converted this plaque into a knowledge stone, since all you'll receive is a translated word, so you might as well put your nav data to good use and earn some easy units. Once you're at the ruin, you can make a scan and see that there are a lot of artifact fragments. Now these fragments are actually keys, and you'll need three of them to unlock the large artifact crate. Once you have these, you must take extra care to insert the keys in the correct order, or this will happen. I'm totally kidding. That The order doesn't matter. That, that would be cool though. 
Inside the artifact crate, you then have a chance to get a sample, either biological or fossil, or you might get a lost artifact, which is also accepted by the artifact exchange vault at the archive. But you don't always get any of these, so make sure to check out the item's description for use of the word sample, as well as the label of lost artifact. As a bonus tip, when you arrive at the archive, you can purchase an ancient ruin map for 15 nanites, and you can bypass the visit to the plaque, where you select knowledge of the past and go straight to the ancient ruin site. And as a super duper bonus tip, as you've probably seen, each archive has an exchange vault up with all the other vendors. And if you go down below, you'll see an additional exchange vault. Which is great because as you've noticed, exchange vaults only let you do it once and then they lock. So if you go down below, you can exchange one more time with the one you just got and increase your value even more. All right, so how many of mine were on your list as far as things that confused you when you first started out? Let me know what you think about my choices because you know I know with 100% certainty, this list could be a lot longer. And maybe you'll find your comment and tip in the next installment. If you were tripped up about something in particular, there's a pretty good chance there's a new traveler having the same question at this very moment, so don't be shy with leaving a comment. Thanks so much for watching, guys. This is Taylor with Whiskey Barrel Gaming, signing off.